on a Friday, just watching TV, I found this mess. So I sat up, turned myself in every angle to make sure that's what I felt, and I felt this mess. I felt it wasn't there before. In the next five minutes, 15 Americans will be diagnosed with cancer. Five others will die from it. Cancer is a genetic disease. Sometimes we inherit faulty genes from our parents, but most cancers result from genetic damage caused by our lifestyle and our environment. Over time, this genetic damage causes cells to grow and divide uncontrollably. Each individual who presents with a cancer essentially is presenting with a unique disease that's a, a combination of the things that have gone wrong and wrong in the cancer cells and also how the rest of the body is responding to that. I was tes tested for that gene and I didn't have that gene. So it wasn't, it wasn't inherited. My doctor said, this is just dumb luck. At the nonprofit Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine, scientists are working to unravel the complex genetic relationships that contribute to cancer. Work at the Jackson Laboratory in the 1930s first revealed that cancer wasn't caused by a single gene, but by multiple genes working in concert. This was a seminal idea, but it wasn't until a half century later that technology allowed scientists to look at gene networks as well as individual genes in cancer. And a new approach emerged called systems genetics. Systems genetics is um, a departure from the traditional approach to trying to understand the genetic basis of biology and disease. So traditionally, we, we would have approached these problems by looking at one gene at a time. Um, systems genetics is actually looking at all of the genes and their interactions in the context of biological processes. When you sequence brain cancers or lung cancers and you find some brain cancers have mutations in genes A, some in gene B, some in gene C, but A, B, C, D, and E make a pathway, you realize maybe we shouldn't be fussing over the fact that the cancer has mutations in this gene or that gene or this gene, but rather it has a mutation in this pathway and then another one has a mutation in that pathway. And so while it might seem that the problem is getting more and more complex, it could be from the right point of view, it's getting simpler. The interdisciplinary collaboration that is one of its hallmarks makes the Jackson Laboratory uniquely suited to the study of complex genetic systems. And in the end, studying networks may lead to better answers. So the information is, is new. It's, it's kind of a new perspective on cancer biology. And I think the data that we're generating are going to have some really important consequences for developing therapeutics and diagnostic tools um, for, for cancer research. There's got to be something out there that can make an impact on this. So this is, this is extremely, um, extremely important to me. One of the world's preeminent genetics research labs, the Jackson Laboratory is a cancer center designated by the National Cancer Institute. The more than 60 scientists in Jackson's Cancer Center collectively hold nearly 150 research grants, totaling more than $60 million. Their work focuses on many causes of cancer and on possible new ways of treating or preventing the disease. The collaborative environment provides fertile ground for new discoveries. Carol Bolt is exploring how genes and networks of genes behave in human lung cancer tumors. Rick Mazur is researching how structures on the tips of chromosomes, called telomeres, cause cancer when they erode too much. Lindsay Shopland is unraveling the three-dimensional physical structure of the human genome and how it can contribute to the onset of cancer. Chen Kai Dai is studying how the stress response, which normally protects healthy cells from environmental stress, changes allegiance and instead helps to protect cancer cells. Lenny Schultz has developed a mouse that can accept living human tumors. Drugs can be tested on these tumors for their effectiveness. 
Gary Churchill is studying genetic markers that may help doctors prescribe more effective chemotherapy drugs with less devastating side effects. The particular cocktail of, of drugs that I was um, receiving, it hit me like a ton of bricks. It just immediately crawled up the back of my neck and through my head with a raging headache, and I did not want to feel that feeling. But I had no choice. A particularly promising area of investigation for Jackson scientists is cancer stem cells, which are believed to create new tumors, causing cancer to spread. We're learning a tremendous amount about stem cells, and it's really revolutionized how we think about cancer biology, and in some cases is, is beginning to really impact how we treat cancer. The most aggressive form of gliomas are incurable. So we're trying to figure out the contributions and also the biology of cancer stem cells in gliomas and figure out ways to we can um, molecularly target them. The Jackson Laboratory not only conducts basic cancer research within its own walls, it also works with other institutions, including respected medical centers. And what we're doing together with uh, Sloan Kettering is trying to take advantage of the real strengths that we have in the model in the mouse model system and combine them with the best parts of clinical research by basically using the mouse as a vessel for human cells, if you will, and then being able to study that, that individual in an experimentally tractable way. Jackson Lab is a national treasure. It's an international treasure. I think it plays an amazingly important role throughout so many projects in medicine that people probably don't even imagine tie back to the Jackson Labs. We are working with our neurosurgeons and clinicians right now and trying to translate what we learn into the clinics as quickly as possible. So I, I can, in my most optimistic days, I can see that what we're doing now may be able to help patients within the next five to 10 years. I've got a 50-50 chance that it's gonna come back and if it comes back, it's systemic. It, it would either go and show up in my brain or my lungs or my bones or my liver. And at that point, if it does come back, I can't get rid of it. We're going to really learn what cancer really is. And when we know that, we'll know how to treat it.